Hello and welcome to Lifespan Development Psychology. My name is Matthew Poole and I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College and today we're going over chapter 10, Late Adulthood and Death and Dying. So when it comes to the physical development in late adulthood, okay, biological aging is the gradual deterioration or fun of functional characteristics. So it can be uh, in these three phases broadly, the young old, which is from 65 to 74, which have good health or excellent health, is reported by 41% of this age group. They are less likely to require long-term care to be dependent or poor and are more likely to be married, work for pleasure, and live independently. Now, physical activity tends to, de to decrease with age through this age group, uh, though this age group is less likely to experience heart disease, cancer, or stroke than the old. Now, the old old, which is from 75 to 84, this age group is more likely to experience limitations on physical activity due to chronic disease, um, more so specifically on hearing or visual impairments. And the oldest old is the age group of 85 plus. This group is more likely to require long-term care and to be in nursing homes or living with relatives. Now, the centenarians are people aged 100 or older and are both rare and distinct from the rest of the older population. The number of this group is expected to increase to 601,000 by 2050. So with the improvement of medicine, etc., we we're able to live longer uh, and have a higher number of centenarians. So most of these current individuals live in Japan, so they live in the eastern part of the world and have led varied lives and do not provide answers about living longer, though. I really would like to know that. So the Blue Zone Research um, are regions of the world where researchers claim that people live much longer than average. People living in Blue Zones share common characteristics. Uh, they have family, there's less smoking, semi-vegetarianism, constant moderate physical activity, social engagement, things like that. Now when it comes to hearing, hearing loss is experienced by 30% of people age 70 and older with almost half of people over 85 having some hearing loss. Now when it comes to conductive hearing loss, this may occur because of age, genetic predisposition, or environment and involves structural damage to the ear. Now, sensory neural hearing loss is due to a failure to transmit neural signals from the cochlea to the brain and can be caused by prolonged exposure to loud noises, either due to work or otherwise. And I hate it because that information gets right to the cochlea, which is the process right before sending that information to the brain. Now, temporal theory of pitch perception is the sound's frequency coded by the activity level of a sensory neuron. Okay, and the uh, press by susis is, I probably said that wrong, I always say certain words like that wrong, press by cusis, if you will, is age-related uh, sensory neural hearing loss resulting from degeneration of the cochlea or associated structures of the inner ear or auditory nerves. Now let's move to the cognitive development uh, and memory in late adulthood. So how does aging affect my memory? So aging may create small uh, decrements in the sensitivity of the senses, resulting in difficulty hearing and seeing and not storing that information in memory. So with working memory, working memory is a cognitive system, as we've talked about. It's your short-term memory with a limited capacity that holds information for processing temporarily. As we age, our short-term memory loss loses some capacity, making it difficult to concentrate on more than one thing at a time or remembering the details. So working memory or short-term memory is among the cognitive function most sensitive to decline in old age. Thought to either be due to slowing or because of inhibition of irrelevant information, inhibition theory. So with long-term memory, this includes, of course, the um, which is seemingly has uh, unloaded capacity, involves the storage of information for long periods of time, and it can be strengthened by a number of ways through classically conditioned associations, acronyms, or quite simply repetition. The memory of adults of all ages seem to be similar, but older adults rely more on external and meaningful cues to recall information. So they're utilizing in that process of memory in the retrieval stage, they're utilizing recognition rather than recall. 
Now let's look at the psychosocial development in late adulthood. So in this stage, according to Erickson, still revisiting the psychosocial stages of development, uh, was characterized by this age group is integrity versus despair. So the goal is integrity, consisting of the ability to look back over the course of your lifespan with a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of peace and gratitude. Despair, though, will occur when a person looks back at one's life as unproductive and dissatisfied, maybe filled with a lot of regrets. Now, this activity theory supports the avoidance of a sedentary lifestyle and considers it essential to health and happiness that the older person remains active physically and socially. Now, the disengagement theory emphasizes that older adults should not be discouraged from following their inclination towards solitude and greater inactivity rather than keeping the older person artificially busy. The continuity theory suggests that people continue to view the self in much the same way as they did when they were younger. I hear that pretty frequently. You know, they look a certain age, but they feel like they are X age. So people in late adulthood continue to be productive through work, education, volunteering, family life, and intimate relationships. Speaking of relationships in late adulthood, it has become increasingly common for grandparents to live with and raise their uh, grandchildren or move back in with adult children. Grandparenting typically begins in midlife rather than late adulthood, but longer lifespans means grandparents for longer, means being a grandparent for longer. So remote grandparents, they rarely see the grandchildren live far away and may also have a distant relationship. Okay, some of you may be able to resonate with that. Your family's moved away uh, from your grandparents, so uh, you, either you didn't get to see them growing up, or maybe you're experiencing this right now with uh, your own children. Now, companionate grandparents, they do things with the grandchild, but have little authority or control over them and take on more of a friend role. I definitely see that happening a lot. The grandparents uh, have the tendency to act like a friend. Um, and involved grandparents, they take a very active role in their grandchild's life, and the grandchild might live in their home, or the grandparent has frequent contact and authority. Now let's move toward death and dying. In 1900, the most common causes of death were infectious diseases, while chronic diseases were the most common causes of death in the United States in 2016. Many of the top causes of death are linked, at least in part, to lifestyle choices and are preventable or avoidable if the proper actions are taken. So the top 10 deadliest disease worldwide in 2010 including heart disease, stroke, lower respiratory infection, COPD, trachea, bron bronchus, uh, and lung cancers, diabetes, Alzheimer's, or other dementia, dehydration, tuberculosis, and cirrhosis of the liver. The majority, the major causes of death vary significantly among age groups with unintentional injuries being a leading cause of death for the widest variety of ages. Now, in regards to the process of dying, so social death begins uh, earlier than the physiological death and occurs when others begin to withdraw from someone who is terminally ill or has a terminal, terminal ill diagnosis. Doctors as well as family members and friends may spend less time with patients after their prognosis becomes poor. People in nursing homes may live as socially dead for years with no one visiting or calling, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Now, psychological death occurs when the dying person begins to accept death and withdraw from others and regress into the self. This can take, you know, before physiological death and may even bring it closer as people give up their will to live. Interventions based on the idea of self-empowerment for terminally ill individuals has been associated with a perceived ability to manage and control things resulting in better mental health. Okay. Now, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, they describe five stages of loss uh, experience by somebody facing the news of their impending death uh, that provide a framework for understanding the psychological experience of an impending death. So if you, uh, whenever you find out about your or others impending death, you experience these five stages of grief. Okay. Uh, I like to remember it by the acronym DABDA. That helps me. It doesn't have to necessarily happen in this order, but here are the five stages. Denial. Denial is, of course, our refusal to accept reality because it's uncomfortable. It's often our first reaction to overwhelming, unimaginable news, and it protects us by allowing the news to enter slowly. 
Your brain's trying to protect you in a way. Then you have anger, which is pretty self-explanatory. It provides us with protection by energizing us to fight against something and providing structure to an unknown situation. Bargaining involves trying to think of what could be done to turn the situation around. You may bargain with yourself. If you can somehow get through this situation, you promise to lead a healthier life through exercise and eating better, or you may try to bargain with your higher power. Okay, You promise to go to church every Sunday if you can get through this particular uh, situation. Depression, also pretty self-explanatory, involves, which is intense uh, sadness, uh, involves feeling the full weight of loss and an important part of the, the process of dying. And then finally, acceptance. Acceptance is whenever we finally, you know, uh, uh, agree to, not agree to, but we, you know, just accept that what it, and uh, find, find some sort of resolution within our own self uh, that this is a part of life and it is inevitable. Uh, it involves learning how to carry on and incorporate this aspect of the lifespan into daily existence. So let's look at some other models of grief. So Warren's model of grief uh, explained it, he explained it, th they explained it through uh, four different tasks the individual must complete. So accepting loss has occurred, working through and experiencing the pain associated with grief, adjusting to the changes the loss created in the environment, and moving past the loss on an emotional level. Now, Parks broke down grief into four stages, shock, yearning, despair, and recovery. Then there's strobe and shut, which suggested individuals cope with grief through an ongoing process, through either loss-oriented uh, loss oriented or restoration-oriented. Lost-oriented includes grief work, intrusion on grief, denying changes toward restoration and breaking bonds or ties. Restoration oriented, attending to life changes, distracting oneself from grief, doing new things and establishing new roles and relationships. So this concludes Lifespan Development Psychology as a whole. This is our last chapter. I hope you enjoyed this lecture series. If you'd like to learn about psychology a little bit more in depth, please go and check out my channel as I have clips as well as shorts where you can consume information about psychology in a brief manner. I also have another lecture series regarding introduction to psychology, which I encourage you to uh, look into. It goes through an entire uh, college level introductory psychology um, class where you can learn more about this particular field. I hope you've enjoyed it thus far, and please feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content. I hope you have a good rest of your day if you're taking this for a class. I hope you've enjoyed um, going through these lecture videos and learned a good bit more about lifespan development psychology. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and until next time, bye-bye.